All right, let's find our Bibles and turn over to Genesis chapter 44. We're still stalking Jacob. And today we're going to read the, about the third trial that Joseph puts his brothers through. Last week, I entitled the message, Treasure in the Sack. Today, we have trouble in the sack. So if you find your way to Genesis chapter 44. So last week, the steward tells the brothers that he had placed, that God had placed treasure in their sacks. Today we find Joseph putting trouble in their sacks. And this is, like I said, this is the final test that Joseph is going to give the brothers. And he wants to know if if they're going to protect Benjamin. That's his concern through the whole thing. Or if they are going to protect themselves. So he's trying to find that out. Have they changed? Is there some, is there some contrition of heart? Is there some repentance from what has happened before? He's trying to discover that. And of course, he's doing it disguised, although not disguised. He is, you know, he's... Uh, Joseph in Egypt, and they don't recognize him. Of course, he's all dressed up and all that. They would not have recognized him, and it's been 22 years. So he's older. He's got a family. I'm sure he looks completely different to their eyes. So just as the other tests woke up their conscience and the Spirit of God moved in to crush their hearts, so now they come to a true broken-hearted repentance. The story starts with Joseph here in verse 1. We have the story beginning here in verse 1. Notice in 44.1, he commanded the steward of his house saying, fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry and put every man's money in his sack's mouth. So we begin with Joseph really just heaping kindness on the sons of Jacob. He does it again, doesn't he? he and notice the language here. He says, fill their sacks with food as much as they can carry. So he's thinking about now this, you know, these sacks and the animals and how much each one can carry. They want to they max out that load. How much can they take home? He's going to give them every single piece that they can carry. So the kindness of the Lord here is just overwhelming. He gives them all that their mounts could possibly carry. Then notice there in the second half of that first verse, he says, and, and put every man's money in his mouth sack. So he puts the double money back. Again, salvation is free. It is, you don't pay for it. And so here we have a very beautiful illustration of that. These men are receiving the grain everybody else is having to pay, but not Joseph's brothers. No, sir. They, they went home the first time, found the money. They came back the second time with double money. Now they're going back home, and he's putting the double money back in the sack for them. So the, the mercy of God, the grace of God is just overwhelming in here. Um, and then he puts the silver cup in Benjamin's sack. Notice that in verse 2. And put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest and his corn money. And he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. Of course, this is the steward, the ruler of his house that he's speaking to. So he puts the silver cup in Benjamin's sack. And then in verse 3, as soon as the morning was uh, light, the men were sent away, they and their asses. So they're going back home. They've, they've got a full load. It's going to take a while for them to get home. And so they get up as early as they can, and they start making their way back to Canaan. So the Lord has blessed them, but yet something is about to happen because there's trouble and they don't even know it yet. Matthew Henry in his commentary on this section says that our God thus humbles those whom he loves and loads them with benefits. And that is so true because you have uh, both a humility that's about to take place, they don't know it yet, and also, at the same time, you have the overwhelming kindness and mercy of God just loaded onto these boys, and I don't really even think they know that either. So we begin now with verse 4. 
And when they were gone out of the city and not yet far off, Joseph said unto his steward, Up, follow after the men, and when thou dost overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? Is not this it in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed he divineth? Ye have done evil in so doing. And he overtook them, and he spake unto them these same words. Now, this is Joseph's steward, and he's the guy who's over Joseph's house, and Joseph is the one who's over all of Pharaoh's house. So you know that when the steward goes out at the command of Joseph to stop these men and to inspect what they've got, he goes out with a little contingent of armed fellows with him. Right? He's got soldiers or some sort of some sort of armed service with him as they go on their rides and they overtake. So you can imagine the scene. The brothers have their their donkeys and they're full, they're laden down, so they're moving slow. And then here comes this armed cavalry riding up the road and just sweeps across their path and stops them and surrounds them, you know. So that's the scene. So that's the first shock, I'm sure, that the brothers have as they see the steward all of a sudden coming back. But he's not coming back with a happy face. He's coming back with an angry face. And he's surrounding them with these men of war. So he overtakes them, verse 6. And he spake unto them these same words. What words? Well, you go back to there in verse 7. And Joseph said, where have you rewarded evil for good? Why have you rewarded evil for good? Is, is it not this it in which my Lord drinks and whereby indeed you have, he divineth? You have done evil in so doing. So he accuses them of stealing the cup. So all of this is, a, is playing out just exactly as Joseph has prescribed it to play out. Now notice uh, what happens there in verse 7. And they said unto him, Wherefore saith my Lord these words? God forbid that thy servants should do according to this thing. Behold, the money which we found in our sacks, mouths, we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver or gold? With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will be thy, my Lord's bondmen. So here we have this quite this very long speech by the brothers. And what I see here in this passage is their pride. Uh, their pride is pricked, and they puff up just a little bit. Well, maybe more than just a little bit. Let's, let's look at it real quick. So they, first of all, they say, God forbid that thy servant should do this thing. So now they have a morality. Suddenly they, suddenly they have a morality. They didn't seem to have that when they threw the brother in the pit, when they wanted to kill him, when they wanted to kill him so they could stop his dreams, and so they sold him to the Ishmaelites, the Midianites. They didn't have a morality about it then. Oh, but now they do. Suddenly they have a morality. Now they want God to forbid and restrain their actions. These men want what they want, and they want what they want when they want it. Does that sound familiar to anybody? I know it's familiar. I want what I want when I want it. And I'll find a way, right? Because that is the corrupt heart of every one of us. Just like these guys. God forbid, they say, that thy servant should do this thing. Well, why not? Why would, why would God forbid you? He didn't seem to forbid the fact that you wanted to kill your own brother and you sold him into slavery. Why now do you want God to forbid it? Hmm. Yeah, they wanted Joseph dead so they could prove his dreams untrue. Now they want to be cleared of the crime so that they don't have to face jail or worse. God forbid that thy servant should do this thing. They're capable. Don't ever think you're not capable. You're capable. Verse 8, Behold the money which we found in our sacks' mouths we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. Well, now, the double money is certainly proof of their good intention and of their father's integrity, of their father's integrity, because he's the one that suggested it. An examination of their most recent action will prove them to be men of integrity, and that's what they want him to focus on. We brought the money back. It's not, we're not after money. We brought money back. 
We so often forget that God doesn't look at our actions, but he weighs our hearts. He weighs our hearts. So he told Samuel. The Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. The brothers wanted him to see their good works. Well, we brought our money back. We brought double money with us. We're not after the money. Look at what we've done. But no, there's something else going on here, isn't there? There's a heart problem. There's a heart issue at stake. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver or gold? Oh, the arrogance of the human heart. The works are evident, but the heart remains corrupt. How then should we steal, they say? Easy. It's easy. The corruption of the human heart is that thing that causes us to, even in the midst of good works, go the opposite direction. They thought the return of the money was enough to speak to their integrity and honesty, but works are a thin veil of vanity over a heart blackened by sin. Works are a thin veil of vanity over a heart blackened by sin. Don't think that just because now all of a sudden you're doing something good that your heart has changed. It may not have. Verse 9. With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will be thy Lord's bondmen. Wow. So here's their declaration. Pride explodes in anger at the accusation of Joseph's steward. They could have said, and we might say, if we were in the same situation, we might say, how dare you? How dare you accuse me of this? Don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I do? Don't you know what I've done? I brought all the money back. How dare you accuse me? And so their pride is puffed up. It's pricked. It's injured. It's wounded. And so, you know, we certainly don't like it when somebody suggests that we're desperate sinners, do we? We never like that. It's not a thing we want to hear. It hurts the pride. And notice how their pride just goes out of control. Whomever the, of thy servants it be found, both let him die. What? Let him die. Seems extreme, doesn't it? This is how sure they were of their innocence, that they would allow the thief to be killed. But, of course, they knew there was no such thief in their company. Nobody would take the cup, would they? And they say, whoever it is found with, you just go ahead and kill him. Yeah, arrogance. And of course, they learned this, uh, they learned this arrogant declaration at the feet of the dear old dad, because Jacob said the same thing. You remember when Laban showed up and he was looking for his idols, his household idols? Uh, uh, J- or, yeah, Jacob was so insulted by the fact that he would even suggest that he might take such a thing that he said, if you find it with anybody, then you just go ahead and kill them and take it. He didn't know it was with his favorite wife, Rachel. She's the one that stole it. Yeah, that's in uh, Genesis 31, 32. With whomsoever thou findest thy gods, let him not live. So their, their pride is pricked. They're insulted by the fact that anyone would suggest such a thing. And then they say, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. The thing is, ladies and gentlemen... They're already bondmen. They're already slaves to their grief, to their guilt, to their unconfessed sin. They're slaves to their anger and their transgression against their father. But again, this was arrogant bluster and wounded pride speaking because someone had the nerve to say to them, you're thieves. Is it not possible? Is it not in our nature? Is our corruption not so deep and dark? These men suddenly don't remember what they did back at the pit. They don't remember the 22 years of agony over what they could have done, or maybe they weren't agonizing about it at all. 
And then somebody shows up and, call, and accuses them of being a thief. And notice how pride just blooms here. Whomever you find it with, let him die. And then we'll be your bondmen. Of course, they are, they're bluffing because they think that nobody's got it. Apparently, they were wrong. Apparently, we're wrong when we think that we're perfect and sinless and incapable of doing the wrong thing, of integrity and so forth. But notice the mercy here. I love this. Pride speaks up. Sin is, is obviously on the table. Their guilt is hiding behind a thin veil of their pride and all of the unconfessed sin and anger, all of that is it's hiding in the tent. And here this man accuses them. But as soon as they say this, as soon as they give this report, let him die and we'll be your bondman. Notice what the servant, the steward says in verse 10. He says to them, now also let it be according unto your words. So he accepts the offer of the sons. Mm -hmm. Be careful how you bargain when pride is speaking for you. But then notice how he changes the bargain. He says, he with whom it is found shall be my servant. So he's not going to kill him. So this, here we have again the demonstration of God's mercy. They offer death. The steward offers life. What an offer. What grace this is. Their offer was cruel. The steward's offer was merciful. Again, we see the hand of the Lord expressed through this ruler of Joseph's house. He's, he's the one that told them, there's treasure in your sack, and God, your God, and the God of your fathers put it there. He's the one that told them that. And now here he comes, and they're like, oh, you just kill whoever has it, and we'll be your slaves. And he says, okay, that's fine. Here's what we're going to do. The one who has it will be my slave, and the rest of you can just go on home. You shall be blameless, he says there in verse 10. How could it be possible for these men to be accounted blameless? What an offer. What grace. And so it is for us, with no righteousness of our own, to be imputed with the very righteousness of Christ and accounted blameless in his sight. Only the wonderful grace of God would do that for a sinner. Only the grace of God would do that for a sinner. Because every one of us can find ourselves at the bar of God and be lost for an eternity. But he has provided a way for us. Because we're all guilty. Do not be insulted when I tell you you are guilty. You are a sinner. You are lost unless you are in Christ. Do not let that pride puff you up and say, nope, not me. Because one day you will stand before the bar of God. And on that day you will need an advocate. And Jesus is the only mediator between God and men. And he will come alongside you and stand there and say, No, Father, he has my righteousness. I have imputed it to this one. He stands right and clean in your sight. Oh, these boys thought they were somebody. You don't know who I am talking to me like that. Yeah, you find it, you just kill him and, and you take us for servants. And the, <laughs> the steward says, okay, well, let's not do that. Here's what we're going to do. He'll be my servant and you guys will be blameless. 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 They're not blameless. But in God's sight, ladies and gentlemen, hmm, the wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin, how shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. You know that song? For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Number 328 in our hymnal. It's beautiful. Blameless. Hallelujah. Well, verse 11. Then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground and opened every man his sack. <laughs> they were ready, weren't they? They took it down in a hurry. Yeah, the, the Hebrew is really clear here. It's, it, all, that, all that action happens at the beginning of the sentence. They took it, they in a hurry took down all that they had because they knew. Oh, they just knew. They were so ready to prove themselves right, innocent, true men, men of integrity. But what they didn't know was that their sin had caught up with them and they were not men of integrity. And he searched. 
that is, the steward, and I'm sure he had armed guards with him as they went through all the sacks. And they searched, he searched, and began at the eldest and left at the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Have you noticed that everything has centered on Benjamin this entire time? All the trials. First trial was bring him back. Second trial was there in Joseph's house. And, you know, he told the, he told the man in 42, he said, bring your youngest unto me, and then I'll know that you're not spies. And, of course, in 43, Jacob sends Benjamin with the brothers. And then again in 43, uh, when they're sitting before Joseph in his house, what does Joseph do? He sends messes to Benjamin's table. Five times as much as all the others. You know what Joseph is doing in that test? He wants to see if they're going to be jealous. You remember Joseph had the coat of many colors. And the brothers had to look on that and they despised that coat. Because they despised the fact that he was being favored by his father. Now, Joseph favors Benjamin and sends him five times as much of the food that they were having at their little banquet. Yeah, now, when they go home, the cup, where is it? It's in Benjamin's sack. So, you'll notice there, it says in verse 13, they rent their clothes. Oh, this is a good sign, isn't it? This is a good sign for, for Joseph. They rent their clothes and laid at every man his ass and returned to the city. Yes, sin is found out. Grief over our lost condition. The horror of the blackness of our sin breaks the heart. It rips the clothes. We, we thought we were okay, but then discovered that we're not. Condemned before God. Christ didn't come to condemn the world. The world was condemned already. Condemned before God. And then humbled, notice verse 14, and Judah and his brethren came into Joseph's house, for he was yet there, and they fell before him on the ground. Thus broken, we fall to the ground and kneel before the Lord Jesus. With nowhere else to go, we find our place before him. Because we're lost in trespasses and sins, we're dead there. And so we kneel before him because our sin is discovered. And you know who it's discovered to? To them, because notice, um, notice what Judah says there in verse 16. And Judah said, what should we say unto my Lord? What should we speak? How should we clear ourselves? <laughs> They're emptied of excuses. They're emptied of pride. There's no more pride left. They're broken in heart. They come and they just cast themselves down before Joseph. And Judah says the thing out loud that everybody's thinking, what's left? What is left? I've got nothing left. Why? Where? I'm cast adrift on the sea. I've got nothing left. Can I cannot clear myself. There are no words that I can say. Words do not exist. Not enough to make up for our crime. Can we clear ourselves? No. Only the mercy of God can clear up our mess ups, our sin, our transgression, our iniquities. And then notice what he says there, and this is just beautiful. God has found out the iniquity of thy servants. The recognition of the Lord's righteous judgment right here, right now, before Joseph. Joseph hears him say these words. What can we say? What can we speak? How can we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of thy servants. And what iniquity did he find out? Was it the fact that they stole a cup? No. Wasn't about a cup anymore, was it? The iniquity of thy servants is the sin that they committed 22 years prior. And he speaks on behalf of all those men. They didn't steal the cup. So what Judah is talking about here is what's been on their hearts for 22 years. All along, they've been conscious of what they did to Joseph. The guilt has been growing and doing a good work in their hearts. And now we have a confession. God has found out the iniquity of thy servants. In, in chapter 42, when they're in the prison, verse 21, all the boys are talking and they say, Therefore is this distress come upon us. Notice it's 
this distress. In verse 22, Reuben speaks and he says, therefore, behold, also his blood is required. Notice he doesn't name Joseph. He just says his blood. They all knew he was talking about. In verse 28 of the 42nd chapter, when they find the money in their sacks, they ask this question. What is this that God hath done unto us? That's like any of us saying, how come bad things happen to good people? Why has God done this to me? So they're not ready yet. When you're asking that question, you're not ready yet. Because it's not God's fault. Say so they want to blame him. What's he doing to me? And then here before Joseph, with all of them spread out on the floor, their, tor their clothes torn, I'm no doubt they're broken, they're weeping before him. Judah speaks the thing out loud and says, what can we say? How can we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity. Now suddenly they've got it in the right perspective. It's not God's fault that this happens to them. It's their fault that this has happened to them. Their iniquity has done this. God is righteous. They are not. And then they surrender. They surrender, which is a beautiful scene. Behold, he says, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup was found. He just gives them up. He says, we, we have nothing to bring. We have nothing to say. There's no more. God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Please take us for your own. Isn't that the salvation moment for every one of us? Pride is pricked. Suddenly it rises up and then it bursts and all that nastiness comes out and suddenly we look around and we say to ourselves, I've got no place to go. I've got nothing left. No more pride. It's all run out. It's emptied. There's nothing more for me. What should I do? And suddenly we bow before the foot of the cross and we say to him, you found out my iniquity. Here I am. I'm a sinner. Save me. Take me. Isn't that what we do? Oh, it's, this is a beautiful picture of salvation right here. The brothers weren't upset. And here, let me conclude with this. The brothers were not upset because they'd been accused of a certain crime. They were upset that they'd been accused of being capable of that crime. Their pride was hurt. And I think right here is a, a good opportunity for us to think about sin, the doctrine of sin, and how it applies. Because sin comes in two sizes. Size number one is Adam's sin. That is our sin nature. In Romans chapter 5 it says, Because one man sinned, sin passed on to all men, and so all men now have sinned. That's Adam's sin. It's our nature. It's our corruption. It comes and passes down to every one of the human race. Every one of us stand accused before God and condemned because of Adam's transgression. Every one of us will die because of Adam's transgression. That's size number one of sin. Size number two of sin is our own sinful choices. We each one make our own choices. And so very quickly in life, we go from having Adam's corrupt nature to struggling with our own sinful desires, actions, attitudes, words, and deeds. And so when we stand before the cross, we're standing there with two things. My choices, the things that I've done, and my nature, which is corrupt. Which is why Paul says that we are all dead in trespasses and sins. All of the load of this thing is on each one of us. But friends, know this. It's not too much to be forgiven. The blood of Christ redeems us from both our corrupt nature and from our own selfless choices. Number two. When we don't recognize our own crimes, the mercy of God is still there. Restraining, blessing, and providing when these men blew up and they said, just kill whoever has the cup and we'll be your slaves, the servant said, yeah, but that's not the way we're going to do it. Judgment would have, or an anger would have been, yeah, you're right, I'm going to kill whoever has the cup and maybe some more. But no, he didn't do that. 
because he's expressing the mercy of God here towards these boys. They're so bent out of shape because their pride has been pricked. And he just says, look, one will be my servant, whoever has it. The rest of you are blameless. <laughs> I, just, I just delight in that. I don't know why, but I just delight in that. Blameless. They're not blameless, and yet they're made blameless. They're made blameless. It's wonderful. Even when we don't recognize our own crimes, the mercy of God is still there. The grace of God is still available, still restraining, still blessing, and still providing. And finally, the Spirit of God works on us. You know that, right? He's, we've seen that happening in these boys. He's awakening, he's quickening, he's convicting, he's breaking, he's afflicting. He's effectually calling and drawing us to Christ, just like he did them. Don't despise his work in your heart or think that it's some horrible thing that God is punishing you when the whole time the affliction is to draw you to himself so that you might say, save me, a sinner. Just like that man in the temple when he pounded his breast and he said, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He awaits for that kind of prayer. He wants and longs to hear you say those words so that he might bring you to Christ. And dear friends, dear Christian friends, it is time for us to understand that every single day we must confess our sins before him because we still wrestle with those bosom things that still attract us. We still wrestle with that corrupt nature that one day will be completely redeemed, but now our sanctification is progressive and we're becoming more and more like Christ. But let's not hinder that work by not confessing our own sins and thinking that we're, you know, we're okay. The Spirit of God is working. What a wonderful thing to say. How beautiful is that work? The quickening and the convicting, the breaking, the afflicting, the calling and the drawing. It's all wonderful. Do not despise his work in your life. And maybe today is the day when you call on him, just like that man in the temple he said, dear God, be merciful to me, a sinner.